Bojo. Welcome to Wa Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is MBF3C, Grade 11 College Math, and I'm the teacher, Bronwyn Slate. If you would like to participate live today, you can call the WASA studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and also on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available both from me and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled from Monday through Thursday two until three in the afternoon, and we are in our sixth week of our nine-week course. At this point, you definitely should be submitting work for marking. So a reminder that the support questions, the ones with the little pencil icon, are not for marking. You decide which ones and how many to do. If you understand a concept, feel free to skip questions. That's totally fine. If you need more practice, let me know, and I'm happy to send you more practice. The answers are in the back of the booklet, so please check your work as this will set you up for success in terms of if you're understanding something or if you're able to figure out possibly where you're going wrong, which has great value in terms of learning, so check your work. The key questions, the ones with the little key icon, are the ones to submit for marking, so please do all of these questions. Uh, show all your work, your steps, and your thinking. This way I can give you full credit for what it is that you understand. And also, if you are struggling with something, it gives me more information in terms of how I can support you. Okay, so how do you actually submit your work for marking? Well, there's three methods. The first is to scan your work and send it electronically. So you can scan your completed work using a device. If you have an Apple device, the Notes app has a scan function. And if you have an Android device, the Google Drive app has a scan function. These are both free apps that generally come with these devices and the scanning is fairly straightforward. Basically just like taking a picture, pointing and clicking. If you would like some support to figure out how to do this, I have videos on my YouTube channel under the playlist tech tutorials. There's videos for both of these apps to walk you through how to actually scan and send your work. Then you can send it to me either through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca or you could also send it to me through Facebook Messenger where my name is B. Slate Wasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sioux Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at 74 Front Street. We are the bright red building next to the post office, and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. Just stick it in there, and I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. The third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll-free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slate Wasa. All of our radio Zoom classes are recorded and I upload them to YouTube shortly after broadcasting. And then I share them on Facebook. So it's a really easy way to have access to all of our videos. Also on YouTube, I have recorded short videos that explain common errors or confusing concepts. So if you're struggling with something, this is a good place to go and look in order to see if there's anything there that might help help you. Most, all of the resources that are content related, math related, are under a playlist called MBF3C, our course code, that's gonna be the most useful for you. Math is a really visual subject, so I strongly encourage you to access the videos. Just listening to the audio is not gonna give you the full experience and really there's a chance that it's gonna still be pretty confusing. So please access the videos. If you can't join me live through Zoom and you can't access the YouTube videos because you don't have reliable internet or something like that, let me know and I'm happy to send you a copy of the recordings so you get the full experience. So if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and connect with me. My email address is bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. My Facebook is bslatewasa. You can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll-free 1-800-667-3703. 
My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So reach out and connect whenever works for you. All right, today we are looking at lesson 14, which is applying the trigonometry that we've learned so far or that we have learned uh, in this course. So we're looking at problem solving. Our learning goals are that at the end of this lesson, you will be able to identify the trigonometry strategy needed to solve real life situations. And you will understand the difference between the angle of elevation and the angle of depression. So you know you've met these learning goals because you can comfortably and confidently identify which trig strategy to use depending on the situation. And you can visualize draw a situation, including if an angle of elevation or depression is involved. So when will you use this in real life? Well, we're improving our problem solving skills. Problem solving is something that's gonna show up in your life no matter what you do. And though you may not always need math to solve your problems, having the skills that we are developing through practicing math problem solving is going to be beneficial for you no matter what you do in life. But first, let's activate our brain with some mental math. I am a firm believer that mad math minutes are not beneficial and do not set students up for success and therefore do not set adults up for success. So instead of using that as a tool, we develop strategies that you can use in various situations that develop comfort and confidence uh, when using numbers. So our question today is 125 times 6. And we're going to use a strategy of breaking factors into smaller factors. So remember, factors are the two numbers, two or more numbers that multiply to become a product, become an answer in a multiplication question. So with multiplication, it's what's called commutative, which means that if we, doesn't matter the order that we multiply numbers. So three times four is 12 and four times three is 12. It doesn't matter which number comes first if we're just multiplying. So that means that if we break up our numbers into factors, we can rearrange them and multiply them in any way that might be more friendly. So 125, I know because I uh, have experience, is 5 times 25. So you could just on a calculator try 125 divided by 5 and figure out that it is uh, 5 times 25 is equal to 125, or maybe something you become familiar with. And I know that 6 times, sorry, three, two times three is equal to six. So now I have some different uh, factors that I can rearrange and figure out. And you might decide, like you might be like, oh, well, 25 times 25 is, uh, is also five times five. So maybe I'll break that up further and that might help me, which is what I thought I was gonna do at the beginning. But now that I look at this, I see, well, five times two is gonna give me 10 and that's pretty friendly. And 25 times three, well, if I think of quarters, 25 cents times three is 75 cents. So that's fairly straightforward. So five times two is 10 times 25 times three is 75. So 10 times 75 is 750. And so that means that 125 times six is 750. So by breaking it up into smaller factors means we could rearrange them and make friendlier numbers. There's definitely more than one way to do this. If different things are friendlier for you, that is totally fine. Uh, this is what worked for me this time. Okay, mine's on. What do we need to know before diving into this new lesson? I just wanted to note about some angle notation. Uh, we've used some of it before, but also just to really make sure it's clear for everyone. Uh, there are different ways to indicate angles, different ways to describe angles in a triangle. So here we have triangle ABC. So remember our vertices are capital A, capital B, capital C. We're talking about triangles. So first way um, is that angle A using this little angle symbol that I have in green on my symbol, which is kind of looks like a triangle missing one side. So it's two sides of a triangle. Uh, 
So angle A means that it's the angle at vertex A. So that is the, the corner that we're looking at. That's the angle that we're talking about in terms of that size. Uh, then the second way that we could be talking about it is called angle ABC, which means that we are at this time, we're measuring the angle at vertex B. So when we have three letters, it's talking about we're starting at vertice A, going to vertice B, then going to vertice C. So B is our middle angle, and that is the angle that's contained. That's the angle that we're talking about. So that is another way that sometimes it's written in the math world. So knowing that in this case, we're talking about angle B. And then also sometimes we label angles with Greek letters. Um, so then it's going to be indicated on your diagram. So like if your question says find theta, then you have to, your diagram has to have an angle that is labeled theta. So theta is a Greek letter. Uh, so very common ones are theta, which is like an O with a line, horizontal line in the middle, beta, which is like a fancy B, alpha, which is a fancy A. These are all very, very common. Uh, your book also, I think if you have an older version of the book, uses uh, this, this, Greek, this letter here, which kind of looks like a fancy J maybe. Uh, and I could not find out what letter that is supposed to represent. Um, so it is just a notation thing in your booklet if it's still there. Uh, just something to note. But anyway, those are the three different ways that we can talk about angles. So that's just important to know what it is that we're talking about. All right, so the other thing that we want to talk about is parallel lines. So here I have two parallel lines on my screen and uh, I'm telling you that they're parallel. So I haven't indicated with the symbols, uh, which are like usually little arrows that show you that those lines are parallel. But if you have lines that are um, from one of the parallel lines to the other parallel lines, sometimes we call these transverse, but also just generally if you are a line cuts between those two parallel lines, then the angle up to the top parallel line and the angle down from the line to the bottom parallel line, those angles are the same. So here you can see that A and A, those angles are equal. Also, on the other side of here, even if your line is at a different angle, uh, but still in those positions, in this case, B and B are the same. Um, so that can be really useful in what we're going to be looking at today, uh, knowing that these angles are the same when you have parallel lines. Okay, active learning. What is new today? So first, before we dive into looking at specific questions, let's walk through some steps to solving problems. So how do we actually attack a trig word problem? They can be overwhelming. You can just get a lot of words and a lot of information. And it's like, how do you even start? So for me, the best thing to do when you're doing a trigonometry word problem or you're looking at a trigonometry situation is to draw a diagram or visualize what is happening. If drawing is not your thing and it doesn't help you, then just picturing it in your head what's going on works the best for you, go for it. Again, as you've seen, I am not an amazing artist. My straight lines are rarely straight and my I like to add trees or people, um, but you don't need to. But just having that visualization really helps me figure out what it is that's going on in a problem. So a really good place to start is to draw a diagram. Then figure out what info that you know and what inform information do you need to know? What are you trying to find? That is super important because then you know what direction you need to be going in. Third, choose a strategy. So we have three strategies with trigonometry in this course. So primary trigonometry is the most straightforward. So it's a really great idea to check first to see if that makes sense. So that's the Sakatoa or sine, cosine, and tan. So if you can use primary trigonometry, I would strongly encourage you to, because that's 
the most direct and least likely to make mistakes because it's the least complicated. Then look to see if the sine law or the cosine law are going to be your next. Those are going to be your other options to figure out which one of those might work if primary trigonometry does not work. Then you're going to use the formulas to complete your calculations. You do not need to have the formulas memorized. Uh, save your brain space for applying things, know how to use the formulas, but I'm a strong believer of looking things up as you need them. If you have it memorized, great, but you don't need to spend a lot of time figuring out how to memorize them. Uh, look it up and being able to apply it is much more important in my perspective. And then number five, I strongly encourage you to write a sentence to make sure your answer, your number, actually answers the question. So often students can just be like, great, I got a number, awesome, I'm done, move on. But possibly there's multiple steps. And so going back and actually answering your question means that I know that you know what you're talking about. And you also are able to check your work to make sure that you've actually answered the question and you're not missing pieces of information or your number doesn't maybe it doesn't make any sense. Maybe you made a calculation error and you by going back and looking at the question and saying, oh, I'm talking about height and I got three millimeters. Does that make any sense? Does it make any sense that I'm talking about three millimeters? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. So returning back to your question and actually answering it with a sentence is really great practice. Also, remember, there might be more than one way to solve a problem. And it's okay for you to do what makes the most sense for you. I'm not looking for you to figure out what I want or how I would solve it and do the same way as me. It is fine for you to do what makes the most sense for you. That's totally cool. So someone else might do the same question a different way. That's fine. The only caveat is that if the question says to use a specific strategy, then I'm looking to evaluate that specific strategy. And so then... I'm asking you to actually use that strategy in order to show me that you understand that strategy. In real life, most likely you're not ever going to have this case where it's like, you have to solve this problem using this idea. That's not likely. But here, as we're developing skills, I may at some point ask you to use a specific strategy, and then you need to use that one. Otherwise, do what makes the most sense for you. Okay, so then you're probably asking me, well, then how do I know which strategy to use? Great, I can pick whichever one, but how do I know which is the best one for me or just in general? So as I said before, primary trigonometry is your most straightforward strategy. Remember, this is what some people call Sakatoa. So this is when you have a right angle triangle. So the sine law and the cosine law still are true when you have a right angle triangle, but they are more work. So I strongly encourage you to use the primary trigonometry strategies if you have a right angle triangle. So this is when sine A is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse, cosine A is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, and tan A is equal to opposite over adjacent with a right angle triangle. It's the easiest if, or the more straightforward if you're able to. So then the sine law you're going to use when you know two angles and a side. So then you can solve for any side using small a over sine a equals small b over sine b equals small c over sine c. Or when you know two sides at an angle that is opposite one of the known sides. So then you can side solve for the other opposite angle with sine a over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. So that's, if either of those situations are true, these are great options. And then the cosine law we're going to use when we know two sides and the contained angle. Remember, the contained angle is the angle between those two sides. Then we can un solve for the unknown side, so the side that is across from that angle. So here we generally write c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab times cos c. Remember, it's really important to make sure that you're labeling your sides and your angles so that you have the right. The order does matter in this case. You need to know that your cos c and your c squared, those ones are the ones that are across from each other. Uh, super important. 
Or you can, if you know all the three sides, then you can solve for any unknown angle by using cos C is equal to A squared plus B squared minus C squared, all divided by 2AB. Again, important to label your sides and your angles, super important. So this is a really good screen to screenshot or to print out because then you can refer back to it in terms of your situation. It has all your formulas on it and you can look back and say, okay, what's my situation? This is my situation. Or this is gonna be the best tool that I have while problem solving. Totally fine to have reference material. You don't have to have it all memorized. If you do, great, if that works for you, awesome. If not, if you need the this to refer to, totally use it while you're doing your key questions. Um, when you do your final project, you can totally use it. That is completely fine. Use your material, that's why it's there. Okay, so let's look for at an example of choosing the best strategy to solve a triangle. So here I have a triangle ABC where I have one side is 21 feet, another side is 14 feet, and the third side is 16 feet. So I see that I have three sides are given, so we can use the cosine law. I do not have a right angle triangle, so I can't use that. So because I have three sides, I'm going to use the cosine law. We can solve for any of the angles, whatever angle we need for in the situation, by using cos C equals A squared plus B squared minus C squared divided by 2AB. Or we might rearrange the letters depending on the situation, whichever one we're looking for. All right, so now I'm not actually going to solve them. I'm just, we're just deciding which one is the best strategy to practice that skill. All right, so now I have another triangle, ABC, where I have one side is eight, a second side is 12, and I have a right angle. So I have a right angle, which means that I'm going to use primary trigonometry. This is what's going to be my easiest way to do this. So if we need the third side, we can use Pythagorean's theorem, which I talked about in lesson 13 when we were looking at the cosine law as a reminder. This is not something that should be new to you. You should be comfortable with this, uh, but it's there if you need a refresher. So which is C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So we can find the hypotenuse if we need that side. or And then we can solve for any of the angles, um, depending on if we need. Once we have the hypotenuse side, then we can find the sine, which can tell us the angles, the cos or the tan, depending on which ones we want to use. We can use any of those three methods to solve for any of the angles. All right, and then finally, we have another triangle ABC, which it has angle A is 88, angle C is 58, and we have a side CB is equal to 14.5 meters. So we have two angles and one side that is known. The side is, that is known is across from the one of the angles that we know. So we can use the sine law. So we can solve for the third angle using the fact that the interior angles all add up to 180 degrees. So we can always find that third angle if we know two. And then we can solve for any of the unknown sides using small a divided by sine a equals small b divided by sine b equals small c divided by sine c. And that can work for us for whichever one we need. So those are the three different strategies that we're gonna use and how we figure out which one is the best. So now we're going to talk about two situations that often arise when we're looking at real life problems because in terms of measuring angles, on a piece of paper, we can use a protractor to figure out how big an angle is. But in terms of real life, uh, we need to use different tools, which means that we're how we're measuring it is a little bit different. So we're going to use the talk about the angle of elevation and then the angle of depression in terms of how these are situations that is how we actually measure angles in the real world. So. We often, as I like to say, we look with our eyes, not our feet. So when we're measuring angles, we often need to think about if we're looking up or down to see an object. So we're looking from our heads, from our faces. 
So this is where the angle of elevation and angle of depression comes in. So imagining we are this little person and we have these objects. So the angle of elevation, how we figure this out is that if we look straight out to the horizon, so we look straight, not down or up, we look straight out and then we look up to an object, this angle is the angle of elevation. So the angle from looking straight out to looking up is called the angle of elevation. So let's look at a situation where this shows up. Javier and Sima are 325 meters apart, watching a hot air balloon above them. Javier measures the angle of elevation to the balloon to be 54 degrees. Sima measures the angle of elevation to the balloon to be 38 degrees. How far is each person from the balloon to the nearest meter? So they have there are tools that actually measure this angle of like measure in real life that you can look up to a balloon and you can see that angle we aren't going to go into that that's a real life application that's like surveyors you often see them on the highway or on roads but anyway so it exists it's possible to do this but how we figure this out let's draw ourselves a picture that's what we talked about so i've got javier and sima they are 325 meters apart and they're looking up to a hot air balloon. So we know that Javier looking straight out towards Sima and then up that angle of elevation is 54 degrees. We know that Sima looking straight out to Javier and then up is 38 degrees. So you can see on my diagram, this is one of those cases where being able to see really is important. On my diagram, you can see how you're able to figure out those angles are looking up and how that relates. So we know two angles and one side, so we're going to use the sine law. So I'm going to label my triangle. I labeled them. You can label them A, B, and C if you wanted to. I labeled S for SEMA, J for Javier, and B for balloon. But when we do this, we see, wait, we don't actually have any matching sides and angles. So though we want to use the sine law, our line is not, our side is not across from one of our angles. So we need to figure out how to do that. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to find the angle that's at the balloon in order so that we have what we need to figure it out. So this is 180 degrees, take away 54, take away 38, which is 88 degrees. So that's the angle at the balloon. And now we can figure out the distance between the people and the balloon. So Javier, this is tricky because Javier, the distance from the balloon is actually side S. It's not side J because side S is what's between Javier and the balloon. So we're gonna do S is equal to sine S equals B over sine B. So we're not actually using the information about that's close to Javier, we're using the other information. So we fill in what we know, S divided by sine 38 equals 325 divided by sine 88. So therefore S is equal to 200 meters. I'm going through this part quickly because this part we've practiced. If you need more refresher about how to use the sine law, please go back to lesson 12 to check that out some more. So then, for the third step, we're trying to figure out how far SEMA is. So SEMA side length between SEMA and the balloon is side J. So J divided by sine J is equal to B divided by sine B. So J over sine 54 equals 325 divided by sine 88. So J equals 263 meters. So then going back and writing a sentence, therefore Javier is 200 meters from the hot air balloon and SEMA is 263 meters from it. So yes, we've answered the question. And that's how we would use the angle of elevation and then use the sine law. All right, so now let's look at the angle of depression. So again, we look with our eyes, not our feet. So when we're measuring angles, we need to think about if we're looking up or down to see the object. So the same idea, we start standing, this little person, we look to find the angle of depression. We look straight out to the horizon. And then if we're looking down to an object, 
this angle to look down is the angle of depression. That is how we find the angle of depression is by looking straight out and then down. Okay, so what's a situation where we might use that? Here's an example. From one end of a bridge above a railroad track, the angle of depression to the tracks is 37 degrees. If that point is 112 meters from the track and the bridge is 122 meters long, how far from the other end of the bridge is the track to the nearest meter? Again, this can be like, I have no idea. So start with what you know, draw yourself a picture and work your way there. So we have a track going underneath a bridge. Again, these could just be straight lines if you just wanted to draw straight lines. I'm giving you some graphics to help make it make sense. So I'm starting, I have R, I'm starting a person on a bridge or at one end of the bridge and looking down. So that means that we're gonna look to find the angle of depression. We're looking straight out and then down is 37 degrees from this point standing on the bridge. We know that the distance from there to the track, from that where that point is that we measured the 37 degrees is 112 meters. Then we know that the bridge is 122 meters long. So I've finished my triangle now to have across the bridge is point S. So now I know two, because I'm looking for the distance from S to T. That's what I'm trying to figure out. So I know two sides and an angle. That angle is contained. So that means that we're going to use the cosine law because we have two sides and a contained angle to figure out our third side. So that is C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB times cos C. Now my letters don't line up with that because I have my letters are Q or R, S, and T. So I need to figure out which are the right ones to go in. So I'm looking for side R. So R squared is what I replace C with because that's what I'm looking for. And then S and T can go in for A and B. It doesn't matter which order those ones go in. But then cos of R is because the R is the angle across from the side that I'm looking for. So that's, so it's important to get that lined up properly. Then I put in my values. So R squared equals 112 squared plus 122 squared minus two times 112 times 122 times cos of 37, which R squared is equal to 5,602.89. So then I have to take the square root of both sides in order to solve just for R. So then R is equal to 74.9 meters. So then answering our question to make sure we've actually answered it. Therefore, the other end of the bridge is 75 meters from the track. Uh, it's set to the nearest meter. So that's why we rounded it to be 75 meters. And yes, we've answered the question. Again, if you're not sure about the cosine law, go back to lesson 13 and check that out to make sure that you're able to actually do the cosine law. But that's how we would do a dangle of depression question. Okay, so now you can do the support questions on page 35 to 36. Uh, questions one through four are the support questions to help you practice doing these problem solving questions. But let's continue to do some practice because there's still situations that can sometimes be daunting. How this works is that the more practice you do, the more comfortable you'll get. All right, number one, a pilot is flying from Thunder Bay to Dryden a distance of approximately 320 kilometers. As the plane leaves Thunder Bay, it flies 20 degrees off course for exactly 80 kilometers. A, after flying off course, how far is the plane from Dryden? Okay, so as always, draw yourself a picture. So I'm starting with a point that I'm gonna call T for Thunder Bay. I'm trying to fly to D, Dryden. But my airplane going from Thunder Bay towards Dryden, I go off course. Oh yeah, that's fine. I go off course. I was hoping to go directly from Thunder Bay to Dryden, but I go off course from for 20 degrees. And that I'm gonna call P for plane. 
where I ended up. And I traveled that distance for 80 kilometers. So now I'm trying to figure out how far the plane is from Dryden. That's what I'm looking for. So now I have a triangle. Oh, I forgot to la label that the distance from Thunder Bay to Dryden is 320. I was like, I don't have enough information. But if I look back at my question, I can see that I do. So how far is the plane from Dryden? Well, we're looking for a side. We have two, we have two sides and an angle. The angle is contained. That means that once again, we are going to be using the cosine law to figure out the third side. So I'm going to label my sides. And I just changed my color so that it's easy to see. I'm going to maybe change my color if my computer doesn't hate me, but it might just hate me. So across from T is side T. See, it didn't even change. Nope. Across from T is side T. Across from D is side D. Across from P is side P. Okay, so the sine law, I'm still going to write it out in its general form. C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB times cos C. This is because this is how I have it memorized. Um, so you do not have to write it out like that if you don't want to. If you just want to write it out with using the variables that you have in your question, that is fine. Um, but this is just so that I get everything lined up where I want it to be. And now I've replaced it with the letters that I have in my situation. Then I'm going to put my, so I have T squared equals P squared plus D squared minus 2PD times cos T. Now I'm going to put in my numbers. So T squared equals 320 squared plus 80 squared minus 2 times 320 times 80 times cos of 20. Now we're going to use our calculator. And as you know, I just like to put everything in at once if I can, do as much as I can. So 320 squared plus 80 squared minus 2 times 320 times 80 times cos of 20. Whoops. I, I was trying to just type it. It didn't work. Ah, sorry, just life hates me. Okay, so I get 60,687.74. Is equal to T squared. So it take the square root of both sides to get what T is equal to. So back to my calculator. Uh, the nice thing with Desmos is that you can click just this answer. Um, so then that takes the answer from the previous one and sticks it into your new line, which is great. So I get 246.34, so 246.3 kilometers. So have we answered the question? After flying off course, how far is a plane from Dryden? So the plane is 264.3 kilometers off course. No, from Dryden. Okay. So then this question continues to say, by what angle must the pilot change her course to correct the error? Uh, we're not going to answer that question right now just because of time, but using the same strategies, you could figure out what you need to do differently. Okay, number two. If an archer is 5.7 meters from a target and the bullseye is 
50 centimeters below their eye level and straight up and down, at what angle does the archer need to shoot to get a bullseye? Okay, so as always, how, where do we go? So we have A for our archer, and they are shooting, so from eye level straight out is 5.7 meters, because that's how far they are from the target. So that's going to not be difference between their head or their feet. So to T our target. But because we're looking, the target is, sorry. Okay, we're looking down to the target. Right, angle of depression is looking straight out. And the target is 50 centimeters down. Here where it says that it's straight up and down, that means that we are perpendicular from horizontal, perpendicular from the ground, perpendicular. So that means that we have a right angle. So now we have, we know that we're 5.7 meters and 60, 50 centimeters. So at what angle does the archer need to shoot to get a bullseye? So that means that we're looking for this angle. This is our reference angle at angle A. So the trick with this question is that we have two different units. So we wanna make sure that we're putting in the same units because it won't make any sense otherwise because like our calculation will think of them the same units even though they are not. So 50 centimeters is half of a meter because a meter is 100 centimeters. So we're gonna change this to 0 0.5 because then we're talking all in meters. We could put it all in centimeters, either way is fine. So now, if I look at my triangle, my right angle triangle, I have the opposite and the hypot, or sorry, the adjacent. So if I have the opposite and adjacent, we will have tan. So tan of A is equal to the opposite over adjacent. So tan of A is equal to 0 0.5 meters divided by 5.7. So then the tan inverse of tan A is equal to the tan inverse of 0 0.5 divided by 5.7. So angle A is going to be equal to, and now we can get our calculator. So we're gonna get our inverse of 0 0.5 divided by 5.7 is equal to 5.01. So the angle is five degrees. So how we answer the question, at what angle does the archer need to shoot to get a bullseye? Therefore, the archer needs to shoot at an angle of depression, right? Because we're shooting down a little bit of five degrees. There we go. Right, number three, determine the height of the cliff H to one decimal place. Now, sometimes we have word problems where we're given a picture and we need to interpret the picture. Uh, opposed to giving a situation where we need to draw a picture. Now this one can be really complicated because in our picture we have two triangles and it can be a little bit confusing. So we are looking for the height of the cliff, which is H, which is here. So this purple person is looking up to the top of the, to the height of the cliff. And so this purple triangle is actually a three dimension it's kind of like a three-dimensional triangle so this line here is along the ground and this is up so then this line here is into the air um, which can be sort of hard to visualize so you can see our it's a right angle triangle and sort of the way that it's drawn is trying to get you to sort of see that this is a, uh, a vertical triangle sort of cutting the plane um, on a vertical axis so we're trying to find H. So in our purple triangle, 
we know we're looking for H and we know angle 20 degrees. We know it's a right angle triangle. So that's great. Do we have enough information to figure it out? Well, I don't know any of my sides. So because I don't know any of my sides and I, I can't figure out my aside if I only know my angles, that's not enough information. I need at least one side in order to be able to figure out the other sides. So we have to look at this other triangle that we have on here, which two of my sides are drawn in orange. Uh, and then the third side is purple because it's the same as in the purple triangle. So this is often what surveyors do is they have two people using different information uh, to figure out a height or something like this. So in my orange surveyor is measuring and sees to the bottom of the cliff, the angle between the bottom of the cliff and the person is 30 degrees. And they know that the distance between them and the person, the purple person is 100 meters. And then the purple person knows, can measure that the angle between the cliff and the orange person is 65 degrees. And so now they have two angles and a side. So if we have two angles and a side, that means we can use the sine law to figure out a third angle. So I'm going to go ahead and label my corners. I am going to label them A, B, and C. Uh, for the sake of ease, instead of labeling them orange and purple. Um, but you can label them orange and purple if you want, which means that I'm labeling my sides, my corresponding sides appropriately. So small letters across from capital letters. So now I know side C for the sign law. That means that I need to know angle C. I don't know angle C. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm going to find angle C, which is 180 degrees, take away 30, take away 65. Well, 180 take away 30 is 150. 150 take away 65. Well, 150 take away 50 is going to be 100. So then 100 take away 15 is going to be 85. No, yes, 85 degrees. So angle C on the ground is 85 degrees. Remember this angle C is between this orange line and this purple line, whereas this 90 degrees angle is between the two purple lines that are, it's up in the air. Okay, so now I have angle C. So that means that I could find side A, which is the side that both these triangles share, because I can use angle C and 100 meters, and I can use angle A and side A. So now I'm going to use, I'm gonna find, side A using the sign law. So I'm looking for a side, so I'm gonna put little a on top of sign A is equal to little a on top, or sorry, little c on top of sign C. So little a is what I'm trying to find. So if time over sign 30 is equal to 100 divided by sign 85. So A is equal to 100 times sine 30 divided by sine 85. As always, I'm jump going through the sine law quickly because that is not what our focus is in this lesson. So put it into my calculator, 100 times sine 30 divided by sine 85 is equal to 50.19. So side A is equal to 50.19. So now, so that was our second step. So then our third step, we're gonna find side H. So now I have a right angle triangle that I know a side and an angle and I'm looking for a side. So the side is the opposite that I'm looking for and I know the adjacent. So I'm going to use tan again. So tan of B is equal to opposite over adjacent. You'll find that in real life situations, we use tan a lot. 
So tan of 20 is equal to opposite, which is our H, over 50.19. So H is equal to 50.19 times tan of 20, which is equal to using our calculator. 50.19 times tan of 20 degrees is equal to 18.267, says to one decimal place. Oh, come on. So 18.3. So then we check how we actually answered the question, determine the height of the cliff to one decimal place. Therefore, the height of the cliff is 18.3 meters. There we go. So sometimes you have to do multiple steps when you're doing problem solving. All right, so unfortunately, we do not have enough time to do this last problem solving question. Again, sometimes you need to do more than one step to figure out your problem. Make sure that you're actually answering the question that is given. That's This one's a little bit tricky. All right, so let's quickly consolidate uh, what we've learned today. So looking at lesson 14, which is trigonometry and problem solving. So first we need to identify our trigonometry strategy. So are you using primary trigonometry with a right angle triangle using Sakatoa? Are you using the sine law because you have two angles and one side or two sides and one angle that is opposite a known side? Or are you using the cosine law because you have two sides and one contained angle? So one angle that is not opposite any sides and or three sides. Do you need to understand your angle of elevation, which is the angle at site level from horizon then up to an object, or the angle of depression, which is the angle at site level from horizon and then down to an object? Those are all the things that we talked about today. So hopefully you can comfortably and confidently identify which trig strategy to use depending on the situation. That shouldn't be too new because we've already done this a few times, so now they're just sort of mixed up. And then you can visualize and draw a situation, including if it has an angle of elevation or depression. So the angle and elevation are new and may take some practice. If you have any questions, please, as always, reach out and connect. I'm happy to talk through problems as needed. It's what I'm here for. So give me a call at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll free call 1-800-667-3703. You can email me at bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa. Remember this lesson as well as all of our other lessons, the ones looking at trigonometry, probably useful if this one's hard, are on YouTube at bslatewasa under a playlist MBF3C. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a lovely day, which 